Buenos dias. I'm very happy uh, to be able to give this presentation remotely. I only wish that I could be there with you. It is my pleasure to introduce a uh, history of cannabis as medicine and try to correlate some of the ancient claims to modern research. On this page, you will see my email, ethanruso at comcast.net, and I would be happy to hear from you with your questions. So we're discussing cannabis sativa. This means cultivated cannabis probably the most useful single plant on earth uh, with food available from its seed or fuel from the seed oil, uh, fiber that makes very good clothing from the stalks, and of greatest interest today, pharmacy, mainly from the unfertilized female flowering tops. This plant is an annual um, with different sexes. It's what's called dioecious. And it's in the Cannabaceae family, along with the hops. This is a map of cannabis history. It is felt by botanists that 60 million years ago or more, cannabis developed somewhere in Central Asia. And so you see various numbers there, but with rapid spread to the Far East, to Europe, and to Africa. It did not come to the new world until about the 16th century to the best of our knowledge. And we'll be talking about some of these ancient claims. This is a representation of cannabis in various ancient languages dating from the Sumerian and Akkadian some 4,000 years ago. Uh, also the Egyptian hieroglyphics. A very recognizable one is this in the Chinese. This represents stalks of hemp drying in a shed, and this would be recognized anywhere in China. Additionally, we have it on the more familiar Greek cannabis, which went directly to Latin, and from the Hebrew, cannabosum, which stands for aromatic cane. We are going to jump back and forth in history to make some points about the attributes of cannabis. This one is from China. Um, this is from an oral tradition dating to 2700 BCE, before the Common Era. And it's obvious that they knew the psychoactive properties because they're talking about taking much of it may make one behold ghosts. This would be a uh, reference to hallucinations. Of interest also at the bottom is protracted taking of cannabis may make one fat, strong, and never senile. So this is an interesting claim. We have a similar claim from 1200 of the common era from the Ananda Kanda in India. This suggested that cannabis had neuroprotective uh, effects, particularly when it was combined with a regimen of religion um, and celibacy. Um, and it was said, it is claimed that the man lives 300 years free from any disease and sign of old age. So again, we have a claim of preventing uh, senility. In more modern times, in the 19th century, Sir John Russell Reynolds, who was the uh, physician to the Queen Victoria's household noted this case report uh, in senile insomnia with wandering at night um, in a delirious fashion. He noted that a moderate dose of Indian hemp when given at bedtime was successful in treating this condition and preventing progression. So this prevented the agitation, the wandering, the loud sleep, and also he did not know progression of the dementia. So this is very interesting in, in view of what we know now about cannabis. And there's been a great deal of literature that supports the idea that various components of cannabis uh, are helpful in treating Alzheimer's disease and possibly other dementia. There are several studies uh, that look at 
agitation, uh, particularly with THC, but there are also is evidence that CBD and linalool, a terpenoid in cannabis, will also help. Similarly, anxiety can be helped by CBD or THC in low, low doses, as can linalool. CBD has been associated with at least two positive phase two clinical trials in treating psychosis. And there have already been studies uh, demonstrating in modern times benefit of THC on insomnia and restlessness in demented patients. Uh, a problem in dementia is lack of appetite, and this can be treated with THC. Similarly, aggression may respond to the three agents. Depression may be aided by THC or limonene, another terpenoid. When there's associated pain, this can be treated with either THC or CBD. And memory can be boosted by another uh, terpenoid component of cannabis, this being alpha-pinene, an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor that would be akin to some conventional drugs on the market. Of greatest interest would be neuroprotection. And it's been demonstrated that both CBD and THC can inhibit plaque formation in the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. So this is very promising. There's additional detail in an article uh, that's in press in Frontiers in Neurology and hopefully out soon. Now, jumping back to Egypt, this is in the second century. Um, this is a Coptic uh, book um, and it refers to meshi or cannabis uh, numerous citations um, with special emphasis on using it to treat tumors. From Europe in France in the 18th century, Marc Andier said, the seed and the green leaves crushed and applied in the form of a cataplasm to painful tumors appeared to be strongly resolutive and intoxicating. So another claim for benefit on tumors. In more modern times, this is a demonstration of the application of cannabidiol to a human tumor that was placed in the hind limb of a rodent. And you see the response uh, after 24 days of treatment and tumor volume with this marked discrepancy, which is also demonstrated in the photo. So this was a human glioma cell line exoplanted uh, into the animal. In humans, we have uh, interesting case reports as well. This is a study from Canada. Uh, there were two pilocytic astrocytomas. These are preoperative. Um, there were also postoperative films with residual, but these residuals disappeared in both cases after the families allowed their children to smoke cannabis. Um, in attempts to eradicate the tumors completely. And there are many other similar claims. A more formal study uh, has recently been completed. Um, this has not been reported except online because of a prolonged survival in the treated group. So this is a phase two randomized controlled trial of 21 patients with glioblastoma multiforme that were taking the conventional drug, temozolomide, in conjunction with nabiximols or Sativex, the oromucosal spray combining THC, CBD, and other cannabis components that is already approved for multiple sclerosis. Compared to placebo, 83% of the um, nabiximols patient survive for a year versus only 53% in the controls. And survival uh, was greater than 550 days in the uh, treated group versus 369 in the controls who just got temozolomide. And there were only two withdrawals due to adverse events. So this is a very promising development with a drug that's available in Spain and 28 other countries in around the world. Jumping back even further in time to ancient Egypt, uh, to the hieroglyphics, uh, this is about Shemshemet. 
It says grounded honey introduced into her vagina. This is a contraction. Now we are not sure what that means exactly, but it's strongly suggested that this was used as an aid to childbirth. And we have some demonstration of that in the following slide. Nearby in Judea in the fourth century, in the uh, what's now Beit Shemesh, uh, this carbonized fragment of cannabis was found, and this was analyzed to prove that it was cannabis. This was found next to the skeleton of a 14-year-old girl who apparently died in childbirth. So this is an unsuccessful treatment, but it was surmised that uh, this had been burned and inhaled in an effort to aid uh, her delivery of the child. In more modern times, Morris Fishbein was the editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association. And as late as 1930, he recommended cannabis for labor. Hence, a woman in labor may have a more or less painless labor. As far as is known, a baby born of a mother intoxicated with cannabis will not be abnormal in any way. And this is still done in some cultures around the world, particularly Jamaica among the Rastafarians. Also in more modern times, there has been uh, research on rectal suppositories. This is uh, Professor Mahmoud El Soli, uh, who made a THC hemisuccinate prodrug um, with the uh, idea that it would avoid first pass hepatic metabolism. These are uh, slides from a study I published uh, in 2008 with my colleagues. Uh, this area is in Xinjiang in Central Asia, probably nearby the birthplace of uh, cannabis. This was uh, an ancient tomb, 2,700 years old, um, of a high status individual felt to be a shaman because he had many unusual items um, related to horsemanship, uh, musical instrument, and 769 grams of cannabis in these two containers. And there was no indication that this group of people um, used cannabis for clothing, such as hemp. This had been uh, previously investigated and identified as cannabis, but there was no chemical investigation of it. So we undertook this with colleagues in England. Um, and this is, uh, shows the incredible level of preservation. You're able to see the glan glandular trichomes on this cannabis leaflet, which still looks green after 2,700 years. And here's a trichome with visible secretory cells and a seed. People ask, but these were not viable. We analyzed the material, which looked like this, and it, we're able to identify various more stable breakdown part products of THC, particularly cannabinol, an oxidative uh, degradation product of THC, proving that this was a drug type of cannabis, and uh, the large amount uh, would have been used medically or for religious purposes. The degree of preservation was so great that we also did a genetic analysis of the material and were able to show uh, the presence of tetrahydrocannabinolic acid synthase, the biosynthetic enzyme that leads to THC production. Additionally, there were two single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, that showed a mutation in this gene that had not ever been reported before. But this may be a marker for finding similar um, genetic markers in cannabis from that area with additional study. Jumping back to China, this is from the second century, the legendary Emperor Watou. Um, and um, the legend is that uh, 
while he was playing this game of Go, uh, he was having surgery done. Um, and this was described in a 19th century article uh, translating from the French. Basically, they're talking about combining cannabis uh, in wine um, so that uh, he could undergo uh, surgical procedure. So an early reference to the pain killing and anesthetic properties of cannabis. Uh, this one is uh, from from Brazil. Um, cannabis was brought by African slaves to Brazil in the 16th century. They talk about an infusion of cannabis for various problems, rheumatism, female troubles, colic. Uh, also, putting a pack of uh, cannabis in a toothache um, for its pain-killing properties. In more modern times, there have been many randomized control trials of cannabinoids in pain, some with Marinol, synthetic THC, uh, some with Nabilone, uh, a semi-synthetic THC analog, some with smoked cannabis, and then several uh, with Stativex or Nabiximols. With smoked cannabis, um, if we look at the randomized controlled trials, there is a total of three patient years of data, whereas just in published studies of nabiximols, greater than 6,000 patient years. So clearly there's been more work done with this preparation than any of the others. This next selection uh, was actually taken from Barcelona in the 12th century. You'll notice that this is not in Spanish, but rather in Hebrew. On uh, the modern word for cannabis is clear here, cannabos. So close, but a little different than the cannabosum of the ancient Hebrew. Cannabis was combined with other herbs, as mentioned here providing many benefits, such as strengthening sexual desire, curing sterility, repairing all the ailments of the womb, the stomach and the head, and is called the head shield. Um, and this is from uh, a scientist called Sheshet Ben Veniste Hanasi. Some a uh, few centuries later, um, Garcia de Orto was from a Spanish Jewish family that fled to Portugal and subsequently he went to India in the service of uh, the royal family and provided the first description of Indian hemp uh, or the, the cannabis of India in a modern European language, uh, specifically in Portuguese. A couple of selections uh, about his observations. The profit from its use is for the man to be beside himself and to be raised above all cares and anxieties, and it makes some break into a foolish laugh. So this is a, an effect of cannabis we recognize today, as well as this one. Those of my servants who took it, unknown to me, said it made them so as to not feel work, to be very happy, and to have a craving for food. So clearly, um, very, uh, appropriate descriptions of the psychoactive effect, effects of THC. From 18th century in England, um, a treatise on plants, I once ordered only the hemp alone. Some pretend the following a great secret against pissing the bed. More properly, they're talking about enuresis or lack of bladder control at night. We know from modern studies um, that cannabis uh, is very effective in treating lower urinary tract symptoms. Uh, specifically, this study was done in multiple sclerosis, 21 patients uh, who remained on their prior medicines, uh, which failed to provide a satisfactory response. And there were significant improvements in the number of incontinence episodes per day. Uh, the number of episodes of nocturia, urination at night, uh, the number of daytime voids, etc. So substantiation for another old claim. 
In terms of muscle relaxation, the earliest reference that I have been able to find was this one uh, from Al-Kindi in the ninth century in what is now Syria. This is a stamp from Syria um, commemorating his uh, writings. It says, Hashish eases the muscles of the limbs and what flows. I have interpreted this as treating uh, spasticity. Others may take a different uh, viewpoint. But later, uh, in other cultures, there have been other references. O'Shaughnessy uh, came from England uh, and Ireland uh, to work in India and in Calcutta and wrote the first major scientific article um, on cannabis and his experiments with it in 1839. Among his many cases, he gave cannabis to three people with tetanus, which was uniformly fatal. Um, one later died due to gangrene and refusing an amputation, but what they noticed was that cannabis reduced the spasms, um, allowed people to eat and drink, and uh, they would ev eventually recover over the course of some weeks. And these were the first cases of survival of tetanus with medical treatment. In modern times, we know a great deal of why this works. Muscle tone is under tonic control of the endocannabinoid system. So CB1 agonists like THC reduce spasticity, while antagonists like rimonabant make it worse. CB1 receptors are densely represented in the areas of the brain and spinal cord that mediate muscle tone. Um, and so there are strong effects that are related to this. Additionally, cannabis-based medicines, specifically nimbixamols, approved in 29 countries for spasticity uh, through clinical trials. Um, this is the pivotal clinical trial by Novotna et al. And this was done also with Spanish patients. Um, baseline numerical rating scale of spasticity was seven. Initially, all the patients, uh, although they did not know this, received nabiximols, and the spasticity went from seven to four in aggregate uh, for responders. At that point, uh, after one month, patients were randomized either to receive the same number of sprays of nabiximols that they had gotten before, those are these patients, or randomized to receive the same number of sprays of placebo. And you see the marked divergence, and this was very statistically significant, leading to approval of the drug. Jumping to France in the 16th century, uh, Rabelais referred to Pantagruelian, uh, his uh, nickname for hemp, to treat burns, um, rubbing it on the burns, um, and keeping it uh, covered. And we uh, know uh, that there are many reasons that this would be helpful. Both THC and CBD reduce neuropathic pain, which is the problem in burns. Both are anti-inflammatories, as are the raw uh, cannabinoids, acid cannabinoids, THCA and CBDA. Uh, THC and CBD can produce opiate sparing when they're used to treat pain. Another terpenoid component of cannabis, caryophylline, is a CB2 agonist, uh, a strongly antifibrotic uh, agent that could reduce scarring associated with burns. And it's quite possible that use of cannabinoid agents in severe burns may lead to increased survival due to all of these beneficial effects. After O'Shaughnessy came to England on 1843, there was a rapid increase in the use of um, Indian hemp uh, to treat various disorders, both in Europe uh, and in North America. One of these people was Clendenning, who uh, had great success in treating migraine, including one that was complicated by morphine withdrawal symptoms, that being the only major effective drug they had for pain at the time. Subsequently, um, 
cannabis was incorporated into standard medicines. Park Davis was a major American pharmaceutical company. And this combined morphine, cannabis, um, and uh, capsicum uh, with capsaicin in it. So this is a very interesting preparation from the 19th century, having morphine, cannabis, and capsicum. So it provided a phytoopioid, a phytocannabinoid, and a phytovanilloid, three pain-killing drugs from plants. Uh, affecting the known endogenous systems that mediate pain, the endorphin and cephalin system, endocannabinoid system, and trip channels. Uh, so it's quite possible that this provided better pain relief than uh, preparations that we use today. From um, Switzerland, um, uh, studies um, by Bernhard Frommuller um, noted that Indian hemp produced a type of sleep which was most closely resembling natural sleep as compared to hypnotics uh, that produced a lot of other problems and hangover. He had a thousand patients with sleep disturbance um, with extreme benefit in 53 percent partial in 21 and a half and only a quarter where there was no benefit. Uh, we know from recent studies that cannabis is extremely effective in treating sleep and it is almost always one of the symptoms most reported uh, by patients as benefiting from its use. Evidence of that is from the study now uh, 11 years old. Uh, these were uh, studies of nabiximols in various clinical trials for pain, uh, for MS, et cetera. And in each instance, you see the benefit uh, of nabiximols versus placebo uh, with um, high P values. And uh, again, what is noticed is reduction of symptoms leads to better sleep rather than an obvious hypnotic effect. Back to Persia in the ninth century. Uh, this was interesting because an intranasal preparation was made from cannabis flower juice with other herbs, and it was used for a variety of purposes migraine, uterine pain, preventing miscarriage, uh, etc. Um, so, this was a parenteral treatment, um, particularly noteworthy in migraine where nausea and vomiting may prevent the patient from taking oral medicines. Although nabiximols is an oral mucosal agent, this was first described more than 100 years ago uh, by Marshall. Um, he had a cannabis uh, resin extract that he applied to himself sublingually, uh, noting effects at 45 minutes, uh, intoxication for about two and a half hours, and then normal at three hours. Uh, so very much in keeping with what we know now for high dosing. Um, although there have been no formal clinical trials in migraine, this is uh, an observational study out of the state of Colorado in the U.S., 120 patients with frequent migraines um, who are recommended to get cannabis as a preventive medicine. Um, about two-thirds had used cannabis previously, but what was noticed was the attack rate went from 10.4 migraines a month down to 4.6, which was considered highly statistically significant. Uh, the vast majority had decreased frequency, and almost 40% reported positive benefits, reducing headache frequency or even stopping it when used to quit, uh, acutely. Obviously, this was a self-selected, uncontrolled population. Um, they used different types of cannabis that were not analyzed, presumably by smoking and presumably high THC cannabis. Certainly, though, there is a signal here that highlights the need for formal clinical trials in this area. And. Um, this one is uh, from one of the latter colleagues of O'Shaughnessy after he came uh, back to the British Isles. Um, so this was done in Ireland. Um, 
Corrigan is best known for his work on aortic valvular disease, but he had very interesting cases of Sydenham's chorea, post-streptococcal chorea movement disorder in children that we don't see much anymore. However, there are some more modern manifestations of post-streptococcal problems, such as the PANDAS syndrome, um, which produces uh, marked psychiatric problems as a result of an autoimmune reaction to streptococcal infections. And certainly, uh, it may be that cannabis, particularly CBD, will be a benefit here. Finally, it's important that we consider why, despite all this great evidence of the benefits of cannabis medicinally, why did it leave the pharmacopoeia? Well, firstly, the 19th century cannabis extracts were not standardized as to their composition, and dosing was a problem. People could be underdosed or overdosed. Uh, when people were overdosed, frequently they had such good relief from the uh, medication that they returned to it in a lower dose. Because cannabis initially had to be shipped, uh, taking months all the way from India, quality control was impractical uh, and, as mentioned, quite variable. Despite looking for 150 years or so, uh, the active pharmaceutical ingredient of cannabis wasn't positively identified uh, until 1964 by Professor Mishulam. Uh, so the biochemical basis of the pharmacology was not known. Um, we have to point out that both smoking and oral administration have their own issues. Um, safety remained a big problem um, due to the lack of standardization and variability in the preparations. Finally, and importantly, politics intruded into medicine. In the United States, Cannabis prohibition began in 1937, and it was removed from the formulary in 1941. Various other countries followed in a similar manner. What happened subsequently, particularly in the 1960s, um, and in the ensuing decades, black market cannabis became THC predominant, um, and although Cannabidiol was much more common in uh, older cannabis and in countries such as Morocco and Afghanistan. This got bred out because recreational users were really seeking the THC effect. However, by not having CBD, the therapeutic index, the amount that could be taken with benefit and without side effects, uh, became much lower. These days, we insist that safety and efficacy must be established through double-blind, randomized controlled trials. And one has to prove that the material is uniform and consistent um, in its chemistry uh, and that proper manufacturing techniques are applied every step of the way. However, it's been already demonstrated that this can be done that cannabis can be um, a pharmaceutical with standards that are equivalent to any conventional drug. With that, I will thank you for your attention.